Good evening. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Merced County, I welcome you to the Candidates Forum for the Merced County Sheriff Coroner. The League of Women Voters is a national nonpartisan political organization that encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government. We advocate to impact public policy. We never endorse a candidate regardless of the office. I am Jerry Brown, a member of the League of Women Voters of Merced County, and will be your moderator this evening. If you have not done so already, please silence your cell phones. J.D. Sanders Company, LLC, is broadcasting the forum. It can be viewed via internet streaming later this evening. We want to thank Jim Sanders for providing this service for us. Question screeners for tonight are League members Chris Bobbitt and Dean Neer. League member Rachel Hadley will be our timekeeper for this evening. And Bridget Ferraro will collect question cards submitted by tonight's audience. Mary Hoffman is my reliable assistant. Here are the ground rules for the forum. This evening will do, be devoted to the views and positions of the two candidates running for the office of Merced County Sheriff Coroner, followed at 7 p.m. by the two candidates running for Merced County Supervisor, District 3. Candidates were invited to place their literature on a table outside the chambers. League of Women Voters also has information out there as well as voter registration information. Tonight we will not have opening statements from the candidates. This will allow more time for questions. Each candidate will be given 90 seconds for a closing statement. We thank the public who pre-submitted questions, questions. During the forum, written questions will be accepted from the audience. Please do me a favor and write as legibly as possible so our screeners and myself can read them. When you have a written question, raise the card in the air and Bridget will come and pick it up. Criteria for the questions are that they must be relevant to the office, appropriate for the election, not of a personal nature. Questions cannot be specific to only one candidate. The seating arrangement was established alphabetically. Each question will be answered by each candidate in turn. The first responder to the first question asked was established by a random drawing. The second question asked will be directed to the other candidate first. We will continue with this format throughout the forum. All candidates will have the opportunity to address the same question. Each candidate is given up to 90 seconds to respond to each specific question. There will be no follow-up responses. Candidates, this is your time to inform the voters about your position on a variety of issues. It is not the time or place for you to provide comments about what the other candidate will or will not do. Responses will be timed. Rachel Hadley will signal candidates with cards marked start, 45 seconds, 15 seconds, and 5 seconds. When the allotted 90 seconds is up, the red card indicating stop will be shown. You may complete your sentence and then stop. If you do not stop speaking, Rachel will stand up and say stop. <laughs> Tonight is, yes, yes. Tonight is an opportunity for us to engage in civil discourse, to talk to each other face to face as good-willed people who all basically want the same thing, a government that runs smoothly and efficiently in the interest of its citizens. 
As this evening is designed to provide a nonpartisan setting for voters to hear all positions, we therefore ask that there be no demonstrations of support or opposition to the candidates for their positions. That includes no applause for individual candidates. If there are any such disruptions, we will stop what we are doing while the demonstrators leave the room. At the end of the evening, we will thank all the candidates with our applause. We plan to end this portion of the candidates just before 7 p.m. and start the Merced County Supervisor District 3 forum at 7. And we plan on having that forum go until 8. We may run out of questions before all the screen questions can be asked. All questions remain with the League of Women Voters of Merced County and are shredded. There are two candidates vying for the office of Merced County Sheriff. In alphabetic order, the candidates are Pat Lunny and Vern Warnke. Each candidate will use this microphone at their station. The microphones are live all the time, so please pull them towards you when you are ready to speak and push them away when you have done speaking. Now we will, bring, we will start with our first question. And even though we are starting with Mr. Lunny, we did do a drawing for the two of you and his name was picked first. Okay, so our first question is, why are you running for this office? Well, good evening and thank you for hosting us. Uh, I think that's a very good way to start this forum. Uh, I'm running for office because I believe that Merced County is what could be considered a stress county. Uh, you look at the poverty rates, you look at the crime rates, even our best uh, industry in the county agriculture uh, stands threatened by the water. Uh, I don't think we can move forward in this county in the way we would like to see it develop if we don't make some changes in the sheriff's department. Uh, I've gone all across the county, uh, talked to a lot of people during this campaign, and found very few people that are completely satisfied with the way things are now. So I think we have to change those things. I think my experience and my skill set that I've gained over the past almost 40 years in law enforcement fit the requirements of what will be needed and what my legacy I want to be in five years is that we are in the best position that the Sheriff's Department can be. We're the best department in the state of California, and that's why I'm running for Sheriff of Merced County. Thank you. Mr. Warnke. <clears throat> the uh, reason I'm running primarily is that the fact that we have had a lot of our uh, deputy sheriffs, correctional officers, and citizens that asked me to, to run. They've liked my leadership style, and the fact that I've got 35 years with this department serving the citizens of this county, and I have dedicated my life to doing so. I've worked in every single facet of our department, and I know how to run each part of this uh, department. And having had that knowledge, I can instill my knowledge onto the other officers into the department to have it run more efficiently. The, the issue at hand with regard to changes, there are changes that need to be made in this department, and having been there, I've seen those needs arise. I know how to deal with those changes, and I can effectively take those changes and start immediately upon election. I don't have to learn who the personnel are. I already know who the personnel are. I'm well adapted to the sheriff's office. I know the crime problems that we have in the county, and I know how to deal with them on a front-line basis. I'm not going to be in the office pushing the desk around. I'm going to be out pushing a cop car around and taking care of the, the uh, criminal element, and that's, that's where I stand. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Warnke, we'll start with you on this question. What is your educational background? Uh, grew up in Hillmar, graduated from uh, Hillmar High School, attended uh, several local colleges. I've uh, received over 60 uh, different classes uh, pertaining to law enforcement skill sets. The, uh, I've been to the FBI Tactical Command School the DEA Drug Unit Commander Academy, 
and uh, advanced SWAT. I've uh, been through all the investigative parts of the uh, sheriff's office and I'm uh, and certified in everything that we can do there. Thank you. Mr. Lunny. My educational background, I have a bachelor's of science in biological science from the University of California at Davis. I have a master's degree in public administration from University of Southern California. Uh, I attended Harvard University as a live-in program for state and local government. And I feel that's only important because that teaches you problem solving. And that's the most important thing we're going to face in this coming next few years at the department, at the Merced County Sheriff's Department. We are going to have to be able to solve problems. And the way you understand that is, or the way you attack that is from an outside perspective uh, that allows you to see programs at work, to have hands-on experience with other things than exactly what you came up through in the department. And so I think for those reasons, education is experience, our education is important to your experience. And I think that all of that, all of those uh, schools that I've been to and degrees that I've attained uh, will serve us well as we go forward in the future. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Lunny. What are the top two issues that would receive your highest priority in office? There's two issues that uh, I think that are, are very important. Uh, one is the fiscal condition of the county. Uh, we have got to be able to take what the county has at this point, what it's willing to allocate to public safety, uh, the sheriff's department, and leverage that budget to do things in a different manner than we're doing them today. We cannot, can, we cannot move forward doing the same things over and over again that people are not satisfied with. So I think the fiscal, I think we're gonna, the sheriff has to be an advocate for the department, uh, both at the local level here at the county, at the state level, and at the federal level. They got to, we've got to use them to become our partners. The second thing we have to do is we have to reorient the direction that the sheriff's office is, is going in. Uh, I am firmly convinced through all of my law enforcement experience that the way to solve problems at the local level is to force the deputies out into the local level and to make them accountable and responsible. And the way you do that is you set up substations. And I've said that from the very beginning of this <coughs> this campaign, that that's what I do. I'm gratified that they're, they're opening the, the substation uh, that was in the paper this morning. Uh, I think that those are the two things that we have to do immediately and address. Thank you. Mr. Warren uh, The first issue that needs to be dealt with is the current budget that we have at the Sheriff's Office. We're only allowed so much money to begin with, and it's to take the current budget that we have in redistribute the resources that we have so that the protection is put back onto the street. The second thing that is of utmost importance is the personnel issues at the sheriff's office. We've got eight openings right now in operations for deputy sheriffs. We've got to do something in there now to recruit more qualified individuals to those positions and to allow those positions to, uh, <clears throat> I guess, flourish within the department. What we've got with regard to personnel is a lack of dedication at this point. They're, the morale is down, and I think part of the reason that we're not getting qualified individuals to apply is because they're talking to other deputies uh, with regard to uh, conditions at the sheriff's office. By improving the conditions at the sheriff's office, I think we can make it a more uh, attainable and uh, more of a desirable place to be employed. And by getting more qualified individuals, we'll be actually having uh, better individuals taking care of the problems on the street. Thank you. Mr. Warren Key, what has been your community involvement beyond your work duties? Uh, for years, I've been involved literally in the community. I was the, uh, I guess, senior explorer advisor for many years. I'm also a member of the Merced Elks Lodge, which delves into our community. I uh, started outreach programs through the explorers in every community in our uh, county. 
we had a need for our youth, and because of my experience with youth, we started posts in all of the uh, actual communities. Rather than having a, a student in La Grande or, say, Dos Palace travel to Merced, we actually brought the post to those locations so that they can take part in something uh, other than, you know, wandering around on the streets, giving them some direction. I've cooked. I'm an avid cook. I like to cook. And uh, being an outreach uh, through a lot of folks, I've cooked for uh, disabled folks at the uh, fairgrounds for uh, you know, 15 years. I've been involved with a lot of um, local outreach and through uh, a church I used to belong to. Uh, it's not just something I've just started. It's something I've been very well uh, involved with, and I fully believe that as sheriff needs to be involved with our community on those levels. Thank you. Mr. Lenny. <clears throat> well, my experience in the community has been extensive. Uh, when I was the chief of police of Merced for 15 years, uh, we started a community outreach, a VIP program we call it, very important persons in police service. Uh, we recruited uh, people in to help the department. Uh, it was eminently successful. Uh, there's now that kind of outreach in the community all across the county. Almost every department has that. Uh, perhaps the best example I can give you right off is that just recently I uh, spearheaded the startup of Merced Area Crime Stoppers. Uh, Merced Area Crime Stoppers is citizens in the community that are involved in the effort to reduce crime. Uh, it's entirely a self-standing organization that's the board of directors is entirely people in the community. It's a chance for them to become involved with us directly, intimately, and actually impact uh, crime in our communities. And that's the kind of thing that we have to do when we reach out. Thank you. Mr. Lunny, what approach would you take regarding background checks for concealed weapon permits? Well, let me say this about concealed weapons permits. We know who we want to have them, and we know who we do not want to have them. Uh, none of us want to have people with concealed weapons permits that would pose a safety risk to anybody in the community. Having said that, uh, I think that uh, it's very clear, both Vern and I, and we knew this question would come up <laughs> over this entire campaign, are in agreement with uh, who should have concealed weapons permits and the process we'd set up. I think we have to do fairly uh, comprehensive backgrounds so we weed out the people that we do not want to have concealed weapons permits. And uh, it, it's, it's, you know, a common sense approach. Uh, uh, we, we just can't have uh, a system that is prohibitive that keeps the people that we want to have concealed weapons permit from getting them, yet at the same time we do not want concealed weapons permits out there in the community in people that are not qualified or pose a risk to us. Thank you. Mr. Warren Key. You know, there's a system in place that's been used for a long time with regard to the state. Uh, and a lot of background checks are done that way, and uh, a lot of folks are, are, are vetted through that background check through the state for arrest records. However, I also believe that an armed society is a safe society. It's a polite society. And for a citizen to want to take care of themselves, to take care of their families, and to take the time to get qualified with a concealed weapons permit, is the first step. Another thing that I would implement, and it's not just having the state background check done. If a, a citizen comes to me and lives in the city of Atwater, per se, the other extent to my background check would be to contact the city of Atwater and find out how many police contacts that person has had. Because not necessarily because of police contacts is that going to be on a criminal record. But if we've got somebody that's been howling at the moon seven nights a week or seven nights in a month, I'm going to find out why. That doesn't make that person a criminal, but it also might exclude that person from uh, getting a concealed weapon. Thank you. Mr. Warnke, what do you consider to be the greatest safety factor in our county?
You look as puzzled as I do. <laughs> Shall I repeat it? Yes. What do you consider to be the greatest safety factor in our community? Well, I don't know if we, what they're trying to get as far as a question. Um, I'm going to say right now I think the biggest safety concern that our community would have would be uh, the, the influx of a large number of gangs within our community. That's a safety concern for me. Uh, we're, we're facing uh, a situation now where we've got more gangs now than we've ever had and they're more sophisticated now than they've ever been. We've got to address that to make our citizens and our community and our, uh, our neighborhoods safer. By addressing that one aspect uh, is to deal with the, the problems that arise causing the gangs to want to start. Through incarceration, you take the gangs off the street and then you reach into our, our youth population. Having had the experience of being certified to teach in the school systems, uh, I know that we can reach into our local schools in every community and start educating our youth as to stay out of these gangs. And also by educating the youth, we can educate the parents. A lot of times the parents don't even realize their kids are in a gang and once we point out the, the warning signs, uh, then we can deal with that. But having that question, I'm, I'm just jumping to that as far as a safety concern. That is a huge safety concern for me and I think it's a, uh, an appropriate concern for all of our citizens. And as sheriff, we've got programs that we can implement through incarceration, through education, and I'm going to call it medication, through either mental health, spiritual health, whatever else needs to be done to help get that aspect taken care of. Thank you. Mr. Lunny. Well, the answer to me is very clear on that. It's gangs and guns, uh, particularly uh, the, the uh, cohort of people 18 to 24, uh, mostly in that age range. Uh, they're the ones shooting up our community. They're the ones that we're afraid of. If you uh, take a look at the violent crime rate in the state of California. It peaked in 1992. Uh, we're at less than half the violent crime rate that we were in 1992 as we speak today. Uh, the problem is in Merced County, that's not the case. Uh, in Merced County last year, we had, our, in 2013, last year we had 29 homicides. 19 of them were in the county. That is a safety concern. Uh, Merced Sheriff's Department's been largely absent on uh, gang enforcement. Uh, don't have any gang officers. We have one, I think there's two now assigned to the countywide gang task force. There's no indigenous gang unit. Uh, when I was at Merced PD 1994, we recognized that gangs were a problem when we started the gang violence suppression unit. Still in existence, still very successful. Those are the kinds of things that pose a safety threat to you and I in this community and to me it's far and away the most important thing we have to address. Thank you. Mr. Lunny, how does your experience qualify you to lead a department with over 100 employees and a budget of tens of millions of dollars? <clears throat> well I, uh, I spent 15 years of my, I spent 24 years at uh, Merced PD, 15 of that was the chief of police. Uh, 15 years I managed budgets, we had 130 personnel there. Uh, when I left Merced PD, I was appointed the Director of Division of Law Enforcement at the Department of Justice, that's a statewide system, all the special agents in the county are in the state. Uh, all the labs, 46 out of 58 counties, we did the forensics for all the labs. $160 million budget plus, depending on our capital expenditures for the year. Uh, that qualifies me to run a department the size of Merced County Sheriff's Department. Uh, those are the kinds of, of uh, experiences that will allow us to move forward without making mistakes, without costing or ex unnecessarily exposing the county to any liabilities that might cut into our precious funding that we have as we move forward. Thank you. Mr. Warnke? Uh, the experience that I bring to the table is the fact that I have done the job of the uh, Sheriff's Department on a up close and personal nature. When we deal with the, the situation at the department of over 300 employees and a $46 million budget, because I'm very 
uh, well-versed and have intimate knowledge of the entire department's workings, I'm able to go into that and take uh, responsibility immediately. Knowing the department as well as I do and having the experience level that I do, the mistakes that uh, could be made, I can avert immediately because of my experience there and having the knowledge of the county workings and within the uh, budgetary constraints of our department. Uh, the experience matters within the sheriff's office level and uh, the support of the personnel at the sheriff's office level is also uh, a matter that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Mr. Warnke, you'll start this next question. Where would you find the money to improve and expand Sandy Mush Jail? <clears throat> the um, money right now that's being sought after is through a, a program at the state level. The state has also contacted the county and that is actually moving forward through current administration. What we also need to do is remember that the resources that we have should be and will be redirected and I think uh, more wisely used as opposed to how it's being used at this particular time. The funding level is there. It's going to need uh, state and federal assistance to get that uh, operation built. And then the county's going to have to figure a way to get into the budget, uh, ways to deal with that uh, increase through AB 109 through the, the increase in prison population, prisoner population that we're, we're having to deal with on a daily basis. The current prison that we have right now is woefully inadequate. It has been inadequate for at least 10 years probably longer, and especially now since AB 109 has uh, in fact impacted our communities through the early release, uh, so on. But as far as gaining the money, it's going to have to be through the uh, cooperation and help from the state, also from the federal uh, resources, because they are aware of the needs of the local levels. Thank you. Mr. Lunny. I think if you look at the facility and what needs to be done, we all can agree that we've got to construct a new facility. Uh, $60 million is a number they're kicking around. Uh, I think we can all agree right up front that Merced County doesn't have $60 million. So we're going to have to go into a partnership with the state to fund part of that. But with that comes a match. Uh, so how are we going to make that match? Uh, the way they plan it right now, and it seems to me a viable way to go forward, is to fund part of our match, our probably 10% match or 20% match, with uh, some of the money from the tobacco settlement, which came down years and years ago. Uh, our county decided it could only be used to fund bricks and mortars, which are buildings, uh, so we can use part of that to, to meet our match. The second uh, thing that's going to have to be done, and you are going to have to be part of it, is we're going to have to sell some general obligation bonds to make up for the rest of that uh, match that the at the local level. So those are the kinds of things that need to be forward, but it's important to remember that we already were turned down on that funding issue with the partnership with the state once. We cannot afford to make those kinds of mistakes again. Uh, those are the kinds of things that we need to, to have expertise in, people that have done them before, people that are successful to do them and can move forward and do them again. Thank you. <clears throat> We'll start with you, Mr. Lunny, on this one. How do you feel about requiring deputies who are all first responders to take mental health crisis intervention training? I think, well, number one, uh, the state has mandated that we receive some of that training. Uh, I think it's very important. Uh, if you, if deputies on the street uh, need training in anything, it's recognizing the situations they're encountering and recognizing people that have mental health problems, uh, treating them in a manner that doesn't escalate the situation. Many of the shootings around the state have been because the uh, law enforcement officers have escalated instead of de-escalating the situation and then getting them to the proper treatment. They don't, we don't need to have mentally ill people in our jails. We need to have them in treatment facilities where we can prevent the kind of behavior that we're responding to that they're exhibiting in the community. So I think the training is important. I would support it and uh, I think it will move the department in the direction that we need to go. Thank you. Mr. Warnke. 
It is mandated, and the sheriff's office right now is currently uh, requiring all deputies to uh, attend mental health training classes. Dealing with folks that have mental conditions has been an issue that I've dealt with uh, throughout my 35 years in the department. Recognizing that and how to deal with that is the utmost importance. Having knowledge about how to deal with some of the mentally ill would, I think, prevent a lot of the issues such as lawsuits for, for an overreaction from an officer thinking that the uh, individual was being violent rather than having the mental issues. I've seen before and you've seen it uh, on television because everybody's got a camera, where somebody suffering from a mental issue is tased. We've got to learn how to recognize that. We've got to prevent that stuff from happening. We've got to get the officers to actually realize that the, the last resort is to reach down onto that gun belt and do something that the, the most powerful instrument and tool that an officer has is his immediate knowledge and his ability to figure these problems out, having knowledge and expertise in that will prevent him from having to use any other uh, physical force. And I believe it's very much necessary and it is currently being used. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Warnke, we'll start with you. Uh, how would you select an undersheriff if elected? Is this thing on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, to me, selecting an undersheriff is based upon a person's ability to do a job, and you want somebody that's actually straightforward and actually has a reputation for taking care of, uh, taking care of business. You want somebody that's got the fortitude, the education, and the knowledge to deal with uh, situations at any level, and uh, having that, you, you choose an undersheriff that would exemplify your, my, uh, I guess, way of uh, thinking as far as how to... Uh, get the department to move along. Having a lot of people that are on paper qualified is a lot different than having an actual individual that you know is qualified. And having personal knowledge of a lot of folks is uh, how I would uh, make my choice for an undersheriff. Thank you. Mr. Lenny. Well, I th think, and I haven't committed fully to even having an undersheriff. Uh, I've said that uh, it might be make more organizational sense to have another captain and uh, maybe have the excess then go back to fund an extra sergeant or uh, personnel on down the line. Uh, it's al always uh, organizationally I've found that if under the top position you have several positions, uh, it, it uh, enhances the responses, people don't go shopping uh, to see who they think will uh, approve what they're looking for. But having said that, uh, an undersheriff uh, would be somebody who would complement my skills, uh, somebody who would move us forward in, in directions uh, that, that I may not be aware of or uh, may not be completely uh, 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 expert in. Uh, what you have to remember, though, is that undersheriff's position is a position that's subject to the personnel rules and regulations uh, of the county. And so uh, to prematurely have me announce who my undersheriff would be would be a violation of those rules and regulations, which uh, would only come back probably in somebody filing a unfair action or a lawsuit against us. Thank you. Mr. Lenny, this next question. What do you think is the Sheriff's Department's greatest asset? The personnel. Uh, there are good men and women in the Sheriff's Department. Uh, they became deputy sheriffs because that was their lifelong ambition. Uh, they demonstrated over and over again that they're willing to put their lives on the line when necessary, to make the sacrifices necessary, to work the long hours, the off shifts, the nights, the holidays. All of those kinds of things go into what makes the most important or the most valuable asset on the department. Uh, our position as the administration, as the sheriff, is to provide an environment where they can flourish. Uh, that's the way that you enhance morale in a department, is to make sure that the playing field is level, that it's fair. When somebody comes to work in the morning, 
they know that they have, we have their back and we're going to provide them with the tools and the opportunities for advancement for special assignments that make, make uh, them want to come to work at the sheriff's office and feel good about the job they're doing. Thank you. Mr. Warnke. Without a doubt, it is the men and women that work in the department that's the greatest asset. Without good men and women leading the charge to help our society and our communities uh, be safe, you've got to have that dedication amongst folks. If you've got people that are out there leading that charge that are not good men and women, we have issues that arise. So by, by any stretch of anybody's imagination, having good men and good women and fostering an environment to bring the morale up is paramount of the sheriff. But by, by far, it is the men and women that uh, are the greatest asset. Thank you. And Mr. Warnke, there was some discussion of gangs, but we'll ask this question also. Gang activity is getting into the smaller towns. How do you propose to handle this situation? <clears throat> At our current staffing level, we don't have the luxury of being able to fu uh, fully fund a uh, full-time gang unit. However, we do have a couple that are in a county-wide gang unit. Going into the smaller communities is a uh, past and current practice of our gangs. They're coming over from the big cities. Uh, I'll use our west side as an example. We've got gangs from the San Jose area. They're coming down into San Anella, Augustine, Los Manos, even Dos Palos. And they're, they're coming over here doing their crimes, and then they're going back across the top of the hill. But they're also coming over here to recruit uh, the uneducated children into the gangs. And that's where it's starting. By implementing programs into our schools is the first, first line of defense that we have to uh, help take care of these gang situations. It is a problem that we have. If we don't provide a hero for these kids, they're going to find one on their own. And the gangs are not stupid. They're very sophisticated, and they know how to get these kids and know, know how to recruit them. And they're recruiting them with the things these kids are desiring, with the video games, with money, with the lure of uh, expensive uh, items. We've got to combat that by being smarter than them and getting into the schools and educate the kids and their families as to what the dangers are and the, the warning signs. Thank you. Mr. Lenny. <clears throat> Well, I've consistently said, and I will reiterate it again, that the best law enforcement is localized law enforcement. I truly believe that we have to push the law enforcement down to the level, the local level, uh, by setting up substations, by uh, uh, making the people that man those responsible and accountable. Uh, I know everybody throws up their hands and says we can't do this. Uh, I know that because I did it at Merced Police Department. We split up into three police units. We built stations in each unit and what we did was then forced every person or every officer and commander assigned to those stations to form a partnership with the local community. And whether it was a neighborhood watch board or a community board, together they work to set the goals of that community. I can't be convinced that the gang kinds of activities that we're seeing in the smaller communities now are not going to be a concern and set the priorities on what's going to be addressed in that community. And working together with the community and working together with officers that are assigned there, responsible and accountable, we can address the gang situation head on and we can, uh, we can beat it. Thank you. I'm trying to get as many done as I can here. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lenny, we start with you. What percentage of the Sheriff's Department funding does county administration take as fees and do you feel that money is well used? <clears throat> Uh, well, I don't think they take anything from, I don't think, I think there, there are some transfers, interdepartmental transfers, and I guess that's what they might be referring to. Uh, information technology is one that we, tra that's funded into the, the Sheriff's Department that's then uh, transferred over. Uh, some of the public works, the cars and stuff, that comes out of the uh, sheriff's office budget and then gets funded. You pay it back to the public works. But I don't think there's a percentage taken off the top exactly that, that can 
be attributed to say, uh, here's a general fund uh, allocation to you, and uh, we're taking 5 percent to administ administrate it. I, ha I haven't seen that in the budget. So I don't know exactly what they're talking about when they say what percentage of the budget uh, goes to the, those kinds of issues. But, but I know there, there's interdepartmental transfers. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of any fees that are transferred or paid by the sheriff's office to the county on any, uh, on any level. Uh, the budget is administered through uh, administration and uh, finally approved by the Board of Supervisors, but I'm, there's no fees that are paid from the sheriff to any part of the county. Uh, when we do have issues with public works for building maintenance problems or for IT in, uh, issues or automotive issues or uh, those types, but uh, there's no fees that I'm aware of, and uh, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's, uh, I think we're going to have to have this be our last question. What, and we start with Mr. Warnke, what are your future goals if not elected? <laughs> What's that guy say, Disneyland? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, continuing, I still work part time for the county uh, as a deputy sheriff, and uh, my future goals are to continue to be with my family and uh, be around my grandkids and raise them as, uh, and help raise them as I can. Uh, I'm very much, uh, I'm, I'm Papa, and uh, having my family with me is the, is the ultimate goal for me. And so uh, I will still maintain my involvement within the community. I'm very active in community events. That will not stop. And uh, I, I am very much uh, in favor of uh, helping out wherever I can. And so uh, if not elected, um, First is a vacation, <laughs> decompress, <laughs> and then I'll uh, continue on and we'll continue the fight and uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue on with, as a community involved person. I'm not gonna just stand by and just uh, say, see ya. I'm still involved, I still love my community, and I want my community as a better place for my kids and my grandkids, so I'm, I'm committed. So um, not being elected still doesn't mean I'm gonna go away. Thank you. Mr. Lyon. I think uh, Vern and I, agree on this and we've talked about it several times during the election that the first thing we're going to do whether we're elected or not is uh, take a little break from this this has been a long uh, very difficult uh, uh, process uh, learning process but uh, if not elected uh, my plan is to continue as the chief investigator at the Merced County District Attorney's Office uh, I'm very comfortable in my legacy of what I've done in law enforcement. I've served at many levels. Uh, I want to make a contribution. That's why I'm running for this job. Uh, if it were not to come about, uh, I would be very comfortable uh, concentrating all my energies, uh, all my uh, uh, skill set on uh, being the best chief investigator that uh, the district attorney has ever had. and. Uh, if it were to come about, uh, I would uh, spend some time uh, working with the sheriff's office. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and begin our closing statements of 90 seconds for each candidate and Mr. I'm sorry, say 90? 90 seconds. Okay. Oh, no, 90. Oh, I give you more than nine. She thought I said nine. I'll go for nine. <laughs> 90 seconds, and we'll start with you, Mr. Warnke. Uh, 35 years working for the county has been my lifelong passion. I, I loved working with the county, and I continue working for the county. Um, being involved in this community and uh, dedicating my entire life to it has been something that I, I, I've proven. I bring a lot to the table with my experience and expertise with uh, all facets of the sheriff's office and having a knowledge on how to deal with uh, people on a daily basis is a strong point that I do have. I'm committed, I'm dedicated, and I'm in it for the long haul. I'm, uh, I'm not using this as a stepping stone to go anywhere. I'm, I'm in this to do whatever I can do to make this county a better place for our, our citizens and a better place for my grandchildren to, to uh, be raised. So I thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lenny. Well, I think the citizens of Merced, the voting citizens of Merced, have a luxury uh, in this election in that they have a clear choice. There's a difference between 
Vern and I. Uh, I spent, uh, I came up through the ranks. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of people in law enforcement, a lot of leaders in law enforcement, and I never found anybody that said that your preparation through the first line supervisor uh, level uh, prepared you for the top job in the organization. Having said that, uh, you have a choice. Uh, I have 30 some 38 years of experience, uh, 27 of those have been leading law enforcement agencies, a medium sized law enforcement agency, uh, one of the biggest law enforcement agencies in the state of California. Uh, I can apply those skills, uh, I can, I can uh, do the kinds of things that we need to do to move ourselves forward. I think the question you need to ask is where are we going to be in five years and what kind of environment are we going to be operating in? It's going to be a different environment. We're going to have to make changes. We're going to have to understand where we're going and why we're going. And for that reason, I think you have very clear uh, choice in this election. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And please remember to vote on Tuesday, November 4th or through the voter by mail process. The last day to register for this election is October 20th. The League of Women Voters does have voter registration information out on the tables. We also intend to have tonight's forum posted on the League of Women Voters website, which is www.lwvmercedco.org, and also on the Facebook page. Now please let us thank the candidates with our applause. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Merced County, I welcome you to the Candidates Forum for the Merced County Supervisor District 3. The League of Women Voters is a national nonpartisan political organization that encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government. We advocate to impact public policy. We never endorse a candidate regardless of the office. I am Jerry Brown of the League of Women Voters of Merced County and will be the moderator this evening. If you have not done so already, please silence your cell phones. J.D. Sanders Company, LLC, is broadcasting the forum. It can be viewed via internet streaming later this evening and it will be on the League of Women Voters Facebook page. We thank Jim Sanders and his crew for providing this service. Here are the ground rules for the forum. This evening will be devoted to the views and positions of the two candidates running for the office of Merced County Supervisor District 3, Tony DeSetti and Darren McDaniel. Candidates were invited to place their literature on a table outside these chambers. The League also has brochures about who we are and voter registration information. Tonight we will not have opening statements from the candidates. This will allow more time for questions. Each candidate will be given 90 seconds for a closing statement. We thank the public who pre-submitted questions. During the forum, written questions will be accepted from the audience. Please print legibly and clearly so our screeners and myself can read them. When you have a written question, raise the card in the air and Bridget will come and pick it up. Criteria for the questions are that they must be relevant to the office, appropriate for the election, and not of a personal nature. Questions cannot be specific to only one candidate. The seating arrangement was established alphabetically. Each question will be answered by each candidate in turn. The first responder to the first question asked was established by a random drawing between the two candidates. <laughs> the second question asked will be directed to the other candidate first. We will continue with this format throughout the forum. All candidates will have the opportunity to address the same question. Each candidate is given up to 90 seconds to respond to each specific question. 
there will be there will not be any follow-up responses <clears throat> responses will be timed Rachel Hadley will single signal candidates with cards marked start 45 seconds 15 seconds and 5 seconds when the allotted time of 90 seconds is up the red card indicating stop will be shown. You may complete your sentence and then stop. If the candidate does not stop speaking, the timekeeper will stand up and say stop. Tonight is an opportunity for us to engage in civil discourse, to talk to each other face to face as goodwill people who are basically want the same thing a government that runs smoothly and efficiently in the interest of all its citizens. As this evening is designed to provide a nonpartisan setting for voters to hear all positions, we therefore ask that there be no demonstrations of support or opposition to the candidates for their positions. That includes no applause for individual candidates. If there are such disruptions, we will stop what we are doing while the demonstrators leave the room. At the end of the evening, we will thank both candidates with our applause. We plan to, we plan to end the candidates' night around 8 p.m. We may run out of time before all the screen questions can be asked. All questions remain with the League of Women Voters of Merced County and are shredded. There are two candidates vying for one office, Merced County District Supervisor 3. In alphabetical order, the candidates are Tony Dossetti and Darren McDaniel. Each candidate will use the microphone at their station. The microphones are live, so please pull them towards you when you are ready to speak and push them away when you are done speaking. Now we will begin with our first question, which will be addressed to Mr. McDaniel, based on our random drawing. <laughs> what are the top two issues that would receive your highest priority in office? Uh, I, I feel it's very simple. It's economic development and um, public safety. And the reason I say that, because you can't talk about one without the other. In order to have economic development, which ultimately provides us with our jobs that's much needed in this county, you have to have public safety. Anytime we want to kind of stimulate, not even kind of, if we want to stimulate any kind of investment here in this county, you have to have a safe and secure environment. So my top two ones, economic development and public safety. Thank you. Mr. Dulcetti. I'll have to agree with Mr. McDaniel public safety and economic development. You don't have one without the other. Uh, when people come here to look for, to establish their businesses, they wanna know that they're coming to a safe environment and that their families will be placed in a safe environment. So it's very important that we keep those two issues attached at the hip and we move forward to make sure that we do everything that we can to make sure that we have great public safety and good economic development. Thank you. We'll start this question with you, Mr. Dulcetti. What is your educational background? Well, we can start when I was a little kid and attended McSwain School from kindergarten to the eighth grade, and then went to Merced High School, Merced College, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, where I received a degree, a bachelor's degree. And uh, later on, I went to Modesto Junior College to the Police Academy and to the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. And during the late 80s and 90s, I attended Cal State Stanislaus and received a master's degree in public administration. Thank you. Mr. McDaniel. Yes, I too uh, attended Merced High School. Uh, Merced College and uh, CSU Stanislaus, where I majored in economics and environmental studies. But I still have to say that I'm on a continuous learning venture. Uh, being uh, wrapped up in legislation right now, we are continuously studying what's going on with our folks here in this community and the surrounding communities in legislation. Uh, 
I, and I still say, going to work for Gallo Winery, right out of there, I never learned so much in two years than I've ever learned in my life. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. McDaniel. What has been your community involvement beyond your work duties? I've served on two site councils uh, at McSwain School and at Peggy Heller School here in Atwater. Uh, I founded a nonprofit organization that we organize the local uh, sports boosters here in the county so we can donate money back to their, their um, sports programs. I've also uh, been involved with uh, basketball programs. We started a number of basketball clubs where we traveled the Western United States to bring kids who can't even afford basketball shoes, but giving them the avail availability to play in all kinds of areas from Reno, Las Vegas, and uh, San Francisco. Thank you. Mr. Dosetti? Yes, uh, I feel I have a, an ex extensive uh, record there. Uh, I was a youth soccer coach, I was a t ball coach, uh, and I was also a youth football coach. I coached at Merced College on uh, their football team, and I've been a member of the Kiwanis and the Rotary and the Itlow American Lodge and the Elks Lodge. And during my <laughs> tenure there, I've dealt with uh, Special Olympics. Uh, I forget what they other, call the other Olympics for the kids that are in junior high school. Junior Olympics, I think, is straight out for, for those guys. Uh, and uh, in Rotary, worked with the homeless, feeding them meals at the D Street shelter, and. Uh, and as far as the police work went, the, at that time, uh, was with the Neighborhood Watch and with the Alcohol Drug Abuse Council, as well as uh, allowing one of my commanders to establish a police explorer scout group. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Dosetti, we'll start this question with you. How do you propose to work with the Atwater City Council to improve the city-county relationship? Well, the first thing is, is that I've been out here for the last two years trying to build relationships with all of the council members and uh, department heads. But I'd start out by attend making sure that I attended all of the council meetings and that I would come prepared to speak to the council and to the Atwater residents about issues that were going on in the county that were specifically impacting the city of Atwater and the citizens of Atwater. I would work with the uh, county chamber and the Atwater Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I'd hold town hall meetings and I'd hold meetings with business groups and other people and would even like to see maybe some kind of a municipal advisory board set up for Castle Air Force Base so that the citizens and the politicians here in Atwater can have a place to push forward Castle Air Force Base. Thank you. Mr. McDaniel. <clears throat> well, I'm a resident of Atwater. These folks here that sit at the dais are my friends and my neighbors. And I continue to work with them, not just here at the city council, but uh, within my neighborhoods. Uh, I've coached with them, I've uh, coached their kids, and I've, I'm, I'm totally involved with them. I'm here in Atwater on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I also will have town hall meetings. Uh, right now for uh, my current position, I've set up a, a series of mobile district offices. And these mobile district offices uh, give an opportunity for folks who live in the community not have to drive all the way to the county building. We can have office hours right here at the city hall. We can have office hours at Castle Air Force Base. We can have uh, office hours out in the McSwain area or Beechwood area. This way folks who can't drive in, who can't afford the gas to get there, will allow them to meet with me on an open basis. If you look at all my campaign literature, I have my cell phone on there. I will be the most accessible supervisor that we've ever had. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. McDaniel, we'll start with you. How do you feel about the supervisor's discretionary fund? 
<clears throat> I've been very clear on that. Uh, I don't like it. Um, it's there. It's an extra $200,000 through all the, all the supervisors. And I feel that's an opportunity to put it back into the general fund where we can really use it. Uh, I, I've seen some good things done by the supervisors. And there's some good things that have been done. But at the same time, in the state that our county is in, that's extra money. It's going to be hard to do away with it because it takes five people to vote and you need a three to two vote to, to get rid of it. But at the same time, it has to be used wisely. And I don't think there needs to be any kind of carryover. So at the end of the year, what you don't use, you lose. But when you do use it, let's use it on county buildings and let's use it on stuff, on county stuff right here in the area. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Josetti. I think that the discretionary funds are a pretty good idea. And the reason for that is, is because it's an easy way to get money back into your, your taxpayer money back into your district. And it can be used for a variety of, of things. It can be used for a brick and mortar situation where maybe the VFW or the women's clubhouse needs some repair or something like that and they can apply for the use of the money. I think that what we need to do is make sure that we allow all of the groups in the city of Atwater and within the district to be able to apply for those funds and then we can review the funds, the funding, and then we can bring it to the board. You know, that, that money is just not in a particular district supervisor's pocket to be pulled out and spent at will. It needs another, needs the three votes to be able to spend it in the district. So I also, like Mr. McDaniel, do not believe that it should be rolled over. If you don't use it, you lose it, and you start fresh every year. Thank you. Mr. Dolcetti, we will start with you. What is the most pressing concern for Merced County and what can be done to address this concern? I think the most pressing issue for Merced County is law enforcement, or your public safety, and economic development, as well as water. And that's just become an issue here in the last year with the drought. But we really need to take hold of the economic development and our public safety and get them in a position where we're making progress, that we're not always fighting a drug war or a gang war or having farmers lose millions of dollars in metal theft and things of that nature. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm, I'm coming from when it comes to what are the most pressing issues for the county besides building revenue in the general fund, which will affect everything else. Thank you. Mr. McDaniel. <clears throat> jobs. The most effective, uh, the, the worst thing we have right now is our job issue. And again, it goes back to economic development and public safety to bring investment into the community. Water falls into that as well. The thing is, people are only aware of the water issue right now. The job that I am currently in, we've been working on these water issues for the past five years. It's there. It's happening. That is part of our economic development. If the water disappears, our jobs disappear. And you need somebody up here with the experience who's been working with water from the federal level, from the state level, and the local level. I currently work with all the water districts in the area on a day-to-day -day basis. We can't talk about groundwater unless we're talking about surface water. You have to have a knowledge of the whole situation. So again, jobs is the top of the biggest concern and everything else follows behind that. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Mr. McDaniel. How should the county address our serious air quality issues? Well, I don't think we address it with billboards telling people to ride their bikes to work with the supervisor's pictures on it. I'm not making fun of the supervisors, but I do make fun of the supervisors I work with in Stanislaus County because their pictures are on there. It's, it, it's, it's a big issue. But we have to understand, a lot of the air quality gets blown in by the Bay Area as well. They need to be held accountable 
with their commute and their idling of the vehicles that's blowing into the valley. When you live in the valley, you have to understand, it's very dusty right now, but that's because of our agriculture. You cannot derail the agriculture in the area to save, to save the air quality. Let's look at our dairies. The dairies are doing everything they can. They are stewards of the land. Let's look at our almond ranchers. The almond ranchers, the best stewards of the land that there are. There's dust in the air. I understand that. That's something that we have here. We will continue to work with the state that we do. A lot of the stuff is mandated by the state and what we have to do, and we'll continue to work with that. Thank you. Mr. Dolcetti. You know, we live in a bowl, a big bowl, and what gets blown in here stays here. What we create here stays here. And like Mr. McDaniel said, you know, you talk about all of the dust from all the crops and the, all the, the agriculture that goes on here. Um, short of putting a big fan on one end of us and blowing it all back out to San Francisco, uh, I don't know what you really can do about it. Now, I do know that there are steps being taken to reduce greenhouse emissions. Uh, we've got climate plans at each at all city levels um, we definitely need to make sure that we are doing everything that we can to control the greenhouse gas emissions now as far as agriculture goes you know it's pretty tough on those guys but you know if you want to see a true environmentalist Go talk to a farmer. Uh, you know, they make their, their living off the land. They take care of the land. They take care of what needs to be taken care of out there. And I, I really have a hard time for people to come in here and beat up on the farmers. So uh, we'll just make sure that we do everything we can. Thank you. Mr. Dosetti, how would you address the homeless situation in the county? You know, there, there's two approaches to homeless, and, uh, you know, one is that you have to identify what kind of homeless population you have. And from what I've seen and from my contacts with them, you have two kinds here. You have the first kind are the people that just don't want to follow the rules. Uh, they don't want to go to a shelter. They want to live and camp out because they want to keep their dog or they want to do drugs or they want to drink or they want to have uh, relationships with their other uh, partners. And that doesn't fit well into a homeless shelter situation. You know, you can't have dogs in a homeless shelter because you can't have fleas and ticks and stuff with other people staying in there. The other part of the homeless issue is, is we've got people with mental health problems that are wandering around out there. Those guys need help. And I know that we've done some work with transitional housing where we've identified mental health patients and we've put them in apartments and we've given them some great guidance and gotten them off where they can understand what's going on and they can handle their own checks that they, they get for subsistence. So I think we need to do more of that. and. Uh, just keep moving the, the wannabe guys that like it, that lifestyle, keep moving them around. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McDaniel. Yeah, I think government has a hard time with that because they think they can take the money and throw it at the problem and it will go away. We need to engage with our faith-based and our nonprofit organizations that handle this. We need to really look at the strategies of what they have. Because when you engage with the nonprofits and the faith-based organization, they give these folks a lot more to live for. They give them something. They give them something they can carry with them into the next level. They're not just giving them a handout. They're giving them the hand up. And I think that's the, the approach that we need to take. Thank you. Mr. McDaniel, are you in favor of establishing a groundwater use regulation for our county? I am, I am for a groundwater uh, ordinance. Uh, the state's going to mandate us, and we need to get our groups together. There's currently two groups working on it right now, 
and we have to have a plan in place. But I don't want to overregulate our agriculture or industry. As soon as we start overregulating and taking money out of their pocket, we're taking jobs off the board. We have to bring all stakeholders to the table. Like I said before, you can't talk about water without talking about surface water, groundwater going on. Let's understand, we're in the third year of a drought. We have enough storage for five years. We're being controlled by the unimpaired flows going to the ocean. There's nothing worse than going over the Stanislaus, any of the tributaries that are feeding in the San Joaquin River and watching the water flow into the delta. So that's where I stand on that. Thank you. Mr. Dosetti. <clears throat> yes. Uh, can I have the question again? Yes. Are you in favor of establishing a groundwater use regulation for our county? Uh, yes, I am. And it's been mandated by the state that we're, we're to have that in place rather quickly. But having the infrastructure to bring business here is crucial. And Mercer County should be actively involved to the greatest extent possible in advocating for groundwater storage, flood management, and in general the protection of its agricultural industry. The most immediate priorities that I see here is a res to resolve the lack of groundwater exportation. We need to pass that ordinance. Uh, we need to regulate the sale of groundwater from our county to another county. We need to keep our water in a Merced County because that's our jobs. Our own farmers and residents are suffering deeply due to the drought and the county needs to have a tool in place regarding this issue. So I actively seek funds, advocate for the implementation of methods of groundwater storage. I would also note that I was always supported the Merced Irrigation District proposal to raise the dam at Exchequer in order to increase groundwater storage and will continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Dosetti. Uh, if you win the election to Board of Supervisor for District 3, how would you specifically enhance or improve public safety? <clears throat> You'd have to remember that the sheriff is an elected official and he answers to the public just like a supervisor would. So I would work very closely with the sheriff to see if there were programs or if there were grants, or how we could squeeze some money in the general fund to help build a jail, to hire more officers, both deputies and correctional officers. But the main thrust there is you have to work with the sheriff. He's the top law enforcement official in the county, and when it comes to public safety from a law enforcement standpoint, that's who you deal with. Now on the other side of the coin, you have the Cal Fire contract, and uh, you'd have to work with Cal Fire and the state in bringing more people on board for them. I know that they have been working very hard to put two men on each truck, and it's still one man on a truck. So we really need to address that issue. Thank you, Mr. McDaniel. Uh. It's starting to sound like a parrot up here, but it's about jobs. It really is. The more jobs we have, the more revenue we can raise. And our job as supervisors is to create that revenue, to create that funding source, to find the way that we can work with it. I'm not here to micromanage uh, the fire department or the, the sheriff. We have an elected official that oversees that. But it's our job to come up with the revenue and the funding to allow them to do the job that they want to do. Thank you. Okay, Mr. McDaniel. What are your feelings regarding the frozen meals delivered to our seniors? I've actually had a, a meeting with the director that oversaw that, and he was telling me how important it is to our community. Uh, I would have to work with him to still make that happen. I was very blown away at how that, has to, how that affects folks people who have worked all their lives, people who have put in an effort, and yet during their retirement, they have to depend on those meals coming into today. I will work with Jaswan on that. 
Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dosetti. I do not like the fact that we are delivering frozen meals to our incapacitated senior citizens. Uh, my stepfather delivered meals on wheels for years. And it was one of his greatest pleasures that he would go into somebody's house and he would fix the meal for them, pour their coffee or their milk, and sit there and talk with them, knowing that he was the only contact that that person had for the whole day. And that was worth something to the person he delivered the meal to and was worth something to him. Frozen meals, I don't get it. You have people in wheelchairs that can't reach a microwave. They can't reach the freezer. You know, I, I just don't understand how, how that works when we've had a system in place for years here that worked really well. And I'd like to see us go back to that. If it probably cost an arm and a leg now to put everything back the way it was. But I'd really like to see us go back to delivering hot meals to these people every day. Thank you. Mr. Dosetti, if you had to define the job of a supervisor, what would you say? <clears throat> I would say that a supervisor is a person who helps people navigate the county and the state and the local government maze that, that we've created, the bureaucracy that we've created out here. It's really hard for people to understand where they need to go to get to take care of a problem. The other aspect of a supervisor is to advocate and collaborate with cities, county departments, state departments, and the federal government to bring grants and let our voice be heard at all those different levels. In addition to making sure that we advocate for our constituency on a local level. Thank you. Mr. McDaniel. Uh, <clears throat> I feel the supervisor's job is overseeing the taxpayer's dollars, making sure that they are used in the most wise manner, prioritizing projects, looking out for, for what the taxpayers are giving us. It's your money. And that's what a lot of the, a lot of the folks forget about. Any time that we get money from the federal government, money from the state government, money from the local stuff, that's our dollars. And we have to treat it as such. And yes, we are the customer service for the bureaucracy that's sitting at the county. It is a customer service. It's continuous outreach to our constituents to make sure that happens. But at the end of the day, it's still the tax dollar. Supervisor is a full-time position. I'm willing to give you 50 to 60 hours a week. You have my cell phone number. You'll be able to call me at any time, and I'll call you back. That's a promise. Thank you. Mr. McDaniel, what qualifications do you feel are essential for a county CEO? <clears throat> Leadership. He's the head coach. He's the quarterback of the team. You got to have someone who can work with everybody else and motivate them to get their job done. Somebody who can create an incentive, incentivize your people to get the job done. It has to be leadership. And as supervisors, we have to back off a little bit and allow him to make his team. Once you have a good team in place, it can run. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't get done, it's his fault. So it's all about leadership and creating a good team. Thank you. Mr. Dosetti. I think that a good CEO has many different qualities, one of them being leadership, the other being good communication skills, understanding of personnel laws, understanding of county ordinances, understanding what the roles of all the different people are that are employed in the county and being able to look at those people and have enough faith in those people to let them do their jobs without micromanaging them. Uh, I've watched many county CEOs, I've watched many city managers, and the best ones are the ones that 
choose people that they can trust, that they know have the education and the experience behind them to do the job. And I would look for the same thing in a CEO of the county, his work history and his education and his involvement in the community. Thank you. Mr. Dossetti. How do you feel about the recent closures of four of the 15 branch libraries in the county? How many do you think the county can and should support? Libraries are in a precarious position right now. Uh, with the growth of the internet and the computers, I think we're seeing more and more books leave the shelves and we've got more and more computers going in where people can come in and they can order their books up online and on tablets and things of that nature. I would like to think that we, because of the technology, that we could open up all the libraries again so that people have access to the information and, and to those types of resources that they would need for their educational or their personal enjoyment or whatever they need to use the library for. So that's where I'm coming from there, and I really would like to see us be able to open up all those libraries again. Thank you. Mr. McDaniel. Libraries have been an important part of all counties in this nation. I can remember my fondest uh, memories going to the, to the library. My mom would take me there two to three times a week, and I can tell you the name of my librarian. It was Ellie Maroon, and she's still a great personal friend of mine. But she'd read stories to us, and we got to gather around it. That is an experience that I still carry to this day. And I, I was surprised that you asked, asked the question, and Ellie's name came right to, right to mind as soon as you said library. But the Internet has offered us an opportunity to access books that we've never had access to in the smaller libraries or anywhere else. The libraries have made a nice move in offering Wi-Fi and offering computers there to do that. I think we stick with it. But 10 years ago, it would have been a different answer. Five years ago, it's a different answer. Right now, it's a different answer. As long as we continue to get the technology that we have, I think that's going to be a moving barometer for us. Thank you. And it looks as though we've come to the last question. And this goes first to Mr. McDaniel. What are your future goals if not elected? I have to say, I currently work for Congressman Jeff Denham. I run a business. I run a nonprofit. I love what I do. Working for the congressman, there is nothing more joyful than whenever you can help out a constituent, whether it's a health care need, whether it's a railroad crossing, whether it's a social security issue or anything out there. My biggest priority is helping constituents and helping people. I don't think I can change that. I have found a new love since I've been involved in government. You really can reach out and help folks, and we continue to do it. Thank you. Mr. Dosetti. Well, I guess I could go play some more golf. No. <laughs> uh, no. What I would do is I would keep doing the same things that I'm doing right now. I've got another year left on my city council term. Uh, I finished that. But I would still be actively engaged in the community. Uh, might go back to coaching football again. Um, but I, I, with the Rotary, with the Itlo, and with the other group, the Elks Lodge, I just stay actively engaged in the community and actively engage in youth activities, trying to keep kids out of gangs, off of drugs, and that kind of thing. So I'm by no means finished with, with that. Thank you. Okay, we will go ahead and begin our closing statements of 90 seconds each. And we will start with you, Mr. Dosetti. Well, my name is Tony Dossetti, and I'm running for the Board of Supervisors. And I, I'm running for this board because I, this is my home, and I care about my home. And I have accomplished things on the Merced City Council that I would like to bring on to a broader scale to the Board of Supervisors. As an elected official, I have a proven track record 
of results and keeping my promises. I was elected to the City Council on a platform of fiscal accountability, economic growth, and public safety. And in my time on the Council, we've balanced the budget and we've protected our cash reserves. I said, I do, along with the other six members of that Council, because we all know that nothing gets done by yourself. We've added new police officer positions. We've implemented new strategies that created new jobs. We still have a long way to go, but these strategies are showing work to, that it's working. And I'm running for the Board of Supervisors to bring these same priorities and experienced leadership to District 3 of Merced County. I want to improve the business climate and create jobs, ensure fiscal accountability, streamline county services, and work with the sheriff to make sure that we have the best public safety that we can have. And I would really appreciate your consideration and your vote November 4th. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McDaniel. Hi, my name is Darren McDaniel. I live here in Atwater. I think this is a really big election for the city of Atwater. Yeah, it's a county seat. But we have to look at Atwater. It's the third largest city in the county. In the current situation, we already have two supervisors from Merced. Atwater needs a seat at the table. I am that seat at the table. I'm an entrepreneur. I've worked at the corporate level. I'm a founder of a nonprofit. I currently work for a congressman. I've worked for two congressmen and two state senators. I bring to you a whole wealth of knowledge and information. I have contacts at every level. Not just calling the bureaucracy. I call their cell phones. I call them personally to get things done. I have a proven track record as a businessman. I get things done. I see an opportunity, I seize it, I get it done. Like I said, I live here in Atwater, this is really important. Folks in Merced don't drive to Atwater. Atwater folks drive to Merced. We drive through Beechwood, we drive through Franklin, we drive through McSwain. My kids went to McSwain. I think it's really important to give us a seat at the table. Thank you. Thank you. And please remember all of you to vote on Tuesday, November 4th, or through the vote by mail process. The last day to register to vote for this election is October 20th. The League of Women Voters does have voter registration forms on the table outside. We intend to have tonight's forum on the League of Women Voters website, which is www.lwv mercedco.org, and it'll also be on our Facebook. Now please let us thank the candidates with our applause.